Reef Share is one of those ministries that we have had recently that we started that really is blessing a lot of people and God's using it. And thank you to all the leaders uh, in Reef Share who make that program to be a success that it is. There is a popular song today by a group called Shine Down entitled Daylight. And some of the lyrics of that song say, It's amazing what the hard times can reveal. Like who shows up, who walks away, and who's for real. As Jesus journeyed toward the cross, the hard times are now here. They revealed a lot. They revealed who his followers were and how they were walking away, some of them. Few of them were genuine and they stayed, mostly women. And now it's beginning to get brutal. The injustice is obvious. Nowhere is the injustice more evident than after Jesus was arrested. That's what we'll look at this morning. During the month of March, we're going through uh, looking at the journey to the cross, looking at Jesus going through Jerusalem to Calvary and then out to the other side to the resurrection. We saw the very first Sunday of March, Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He taught the disciples along the way. And then we saw last Sunday the betrayal of Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the crucifixion of our Lord. And then the following Sunday on Easter, we'll look at the powerful resurrection. Today, we're going to look at the trials of Jesus, the legal trials of our Lord. They arrested him. Last week, the story the text left off, there is Jesus standing there, torches in the dark, torches flickering, authorities on either side of him. They have him arrested, and that's where our text ended. And today we're going to look at the trials they put through Jesus through during the wee hours of the morning of Passover week. Read with me Matthew 26, starting in verse 55. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. So it was the wee hours of Jerusalem Passover week. It's dark. The authorities had just arrested Jesus, and Judas had gone into the shadows holding 30 pieces of silver. They had Jesus, and they left immediately to go try him before the courts. Why then? Why didn't they wait until the morning? Because they knew that Jesus had a following. He had a crowd that that liked him, that loved what he did. And if they they tried him while the crowds were present in the daylight, there might be an uprising, an uproar. And so the authorities tried Jesus at night when nobody else was around. So by in the morning when they awakened, the verdict of death was already there. So let's look at the trials of Jesus late that night and early that morning. There were six of them. Three trials by the Jews, three trials by the Romans. Civil trial by the Romans, religious trial of the Jews. Let's look. First of all, letter A on your outline, let's look at the religious trials by the Jews. The accusation was blasphemy. So as they ushered Jesus across the Kidron Valley and up the hill to Jerusalem, the very first trial, the first person they brought him to was a man by the name of Annas. Number one, Annas, the former high priest. Now, you may ask the question, why did they take him to the former high priest first? Why not the current high priest? That's a great question. Here's why. 
The former high priest by the name of Annas, um, he was born a very wealthy and influential man into an influential family. He became the high priest over uh, Israel from 6 AD through 15, or rather BC, through 15 AD. That means he would have been the high priest two years before Jesus was born until Jesus was 19 years old. And then he was deposed as the high priest. But here's the thing about Annas. Annas probably had more power and influence being a former high priest than he had as a high priest. The people loved him. The people so revered Annas. They respected Annas. So the Jews thought, if we take Jesus to Annas first, the one who is revered and respected, and if we get Annas against Jesus first, then maybe when the crowd hears what happened, they'll say, oh, wait a minute, Annas saw fault in Jesus. There must be something wrong. It is said of William Howard Taft, the 27th president of the United States, who was president from 1909 to 1913, whenever he left the presidency, Warren Harding appointed Taft as the chief justice of the Supreme Court, 1921, it is said that he had more power as Supreme Court justice than he did as president. And it is said of Annas, he had more power after he left office than before. So you take him to the most powerful man first. You play your trump card first and get those people against Jesus. So they ushered Jesus to Annas. Annas questioned him, according to John 18, with many questions. Jesus, uh, tell us about your teachings. And Jesus replied, I was in the synagogues and temple every day. I, I taught where Jews gathered. I, I didn't do anything in secret. Why are you asking me about my teachings? Ask those people who heard it. And whenever he said that, one of the soldiers took and backhanded Jesus a pow across the face. And he said, how dare you speak to the revered Annas in that kind of tone. And Jesus said, what did I say wrong? If what I said is wrong, strike me. But what did I say that was wrong? And they led him away from Annas to the current high priest, Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas. In fact, this is just kind of a side note, how did Annas die? Well, we don't have a record of it, but there are some traditions out there and some historians out there that say that Annas was strangled to death by his son-in-law Caiaphas. Now, that's not biblical, but it's what tradition says. So here is Caiaphas, the current high priest, who is the son-in-law of Annas, and Caiaphas, also very wealthy and very, very influential. You see, he had been a Sadducee, which most of the wealthy religious leaders. Caiaphas was the one who held animosity toward Jesus the most. He hated Christ. In fact, there is a hint all the way as early as John 11 that Caiaphas starts to hint that man needs to die. And so they brought him before Caiaphas. Caiaphas had arranged many false witnesses against Jesus. Those people to say oh, the bad things he did. And so he gathered some people preparing for this moment in the early hour morning there, early morning hours, and, and he gathers them there. And the false witnesses really didn't have much to come up with. They said, well, he, he claimed to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, and that took us years to do. He obviously couldn't do that. That's the worst thing they could think of. And so Caiaphas, knowing that didn't work, began to question Jesus. He was silent. 
And finally, Caiaphas got furious and screamed at him, I adjure you by the living God, you young man, you answer me. He was mad. Are you the Messiah or not? Tell us. And Jesus said, you've said it. And before long, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory, the right hand of the Mighty One, who was really in control that night, Jesus. And Caiaphas, angry, tore his robe, which is a sign of grief, tore his robe and says, there you have it. He is guilty, claiming to be the Son of God. Blasphemy! He's worthy of death. Really? There will always be those who hate Christ and hate you because you follow him. Behind Caiaphas during the trial was a, a third group. You'll see number three on your outline there, Sanhedrin. You see, behind Caiaphas were 70 religious leaders, the wealthiest, the most powerful in all of Israel. They were called the Sanhedrin. They were a Jewish Supreme Court, basically. Seventy of them, counting the high priest, made 71. Now, in local places throughout Israel, you would, you would have a small Sanhedrin around. There would be 23 of those. But nationally, you had 70 of the most powerful men in the nation who knew God's Word, the law, backwards and forwards, told you what you needed to do. And they were called the Sanhedrin, so they were backing up Caiaphas. So they all said the same thing, guilty, guilty, he deserves death. The only problem is, the Sanhedrin had no power to enforce the death penalty. So how do you get rid of Jesus? You declared him guilty. You declared that he's claiming to be the Son of God. You want rid of him, but you have no power to enforce the death penalty. So what do you do? You send him to the Romans. They're in charge. They can produce the death penalty. And you tell them, you found him guilty. So, go to letter B on your outline. The civil trials of Jesus by the Romans. The accusation. Treason. Did you catch that? Did you not offer a second? Did you catch it? The charges are different. The Jews charged him with blasphemy. The Romans, they charged him with treason. Why the difference? Because you see, the Romans over here, they care nothing about Jewish faith. They care nothing about the Jews. So if the Jews bring a man and say, hey, he committed blasphemy, they'll say, who cares? You take care of him. Blasphemy means nothing to us. Your faith means nothing to us. You take care of him yourself. And they wouldn't even hear the call, the case. And the Jews do that. So in order to get a death penalty conviction, they had to charge him with something that would get the attention of the Romans. Treason. Here's a man claiming to be a king who's trying to overthrow the Roman government. You better listen to him. You better put him to death. And so the Jews said he's guilty of treason. So they took him first to a Roman official by the name Pilate. Number one, the first trial by the Romans was Pilate. Pilate was an interesting character. I, in fact, I did a, a sermon, an entire narrative on Pilate last year. Pilate was an odd man. He was probably small of build. He was always probably trying to prove himself. According to tradition, according to secular writers, describing Pilate as someone that never really felt capable to be in his position. 
that there were whispers. Pilate got the job, but he's not really qualified. Yeah, he knows somebody. And so Pilate always had this inferiority complex that he had to prove himself, according to historians. And so he was the governor of Judea, which is the southern part of Israel, and the emperor, Tiberius, appointed him. He appointed different governors, different locales. So Pilate was over the southern part, and Herod Antipas was over the northern part of Israel, the Roman officials. So they took Jesus to Pilate first. They approached Pilate, and Pilate said, what, what do you have? What charges do, do you have against him? They said, oh, Pilate, you need, to, you, need to, you need to question him. This man's a criminal. He's dangerous. Really? Yeah. What did he do? Well, you talked to him yourself, claiming to be a king. Didn't you, didn't you have religious charges against him? Well, we brought those two. Then take him back to your court. I, I don't care anything about those. No, no, no. You need, to, you need to question him. It's dangerous. So Pilate turned to Jesus and said, So, are you a king? King of the Jews? And Jesus I love how Jesus, he, he, always, uh, he would punch people's buttons. He got them going. And he said, uh, Pilate, did, is that your question or did somebody I tell you to ask me that? In other words, you can't even rule yourself. Those insecurities he had made Pilate mad. Well, I'm not the one on trial here. You're the one on trial here. So are, are you the king of the Jews? I'm... I'm not a Jew. Your own people handed you over. What have you done? And Jesus responded, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my my disciples, they'd have picked up arms and they'd have fought for me, but my kingdom's not here. He said, wait, wait, wait. What did you say? Did you say kingdom? So you are a king. You're claiming to be a king. And Jesus replied, I, I came into the world to testify of truth. And anyone who, who really believes in truth listens to me. And Pilate responded, what is truth? And Jesus didn't respond. And he said, I, I, don't, I don't see any fault in him. I don't find anything worthy of death in this man. What are the Jews talking about? Tell you what, technically he is a Galilean. Galilee is in the northern part. I'm over the southern part. Herod's over the northern part. I'm going to send him to Herod. And if, and if the Jews want him dead, let them deal with Herod. He's out of my hands. So he sent him to Herod. Number two on your outline, the trial by Herod. Jesus arrives at Herod's, and um, Herod had been waiting to see him. He wanted to see him, and he had been waiting. He was hoping, the Bible said, Herod was, that Jesus would maybe perform a few miracles for him, because he's a miracle worker, and then tell me something, tell me something that's, that's really good. Give me a teaching that's good. So, Jesus, there you are. I've, I've heard many things about you. So, here, you get the one trick pony. Do something miraculous for me. And Jesus did nothing. Well, tell me, a, tell me a good teaching. He said, nothing. And because he said nothing, it infuriated Herod because he was silent. You see, Jesus knew that Herod was not asking out of a genuine willingness to know. He just curiously wanted to see a miracle worker. So Jesus didn't say a word. And it made Herod furious. 
He had Jesus ridiculed. He had Jesus beaten. He had, he, he had him pummeled and Jesus bloody and whipped. And the drops of blood that Jesus shed for you didn't begin on the cross. They began there. The very first time I went to Israel, um, many years ago, I was at my previous church. And I was so looking forward to seeing a lot of things, you know, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, and I was so excited. And, and the place that really impacted me the most that I didn't see coming was the house of Caiaphas. You go in there, uh, and they, you go un, to the dungeon where they, had, where they kept Jesus. Almost assuredly, that's the place where they kept Jesus. And when the beating started, they started there, and the very first drops of blood he shed, standing on the pavement that you're standing on. It was powerful. It was moving. I didn't expect the house of Caiaphas to be the one that really spoke. But it did, because that's where the bleeding started. Herod had him beaten and sent back to Pilate. Pilate received Jesus back, bloodied, and thought, trial number three, what, what do I do here? The, I, I want so badly to release Jesus. I don't think he's guilty. He's done certainly not, nothing worthy of death. And the Jews are wanting to kill one of their own and have us do it. I, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But Pilate feared an uprising of the Jews. Why would he fear that? Because remember, the Roman emperor had made him the governor of this little area in southern Israel, and he didn't want to have an uprising like he couldn't handle it, and the emperor had to send in troops and come in. After all, Pilate's trying to prove himself. So whatever the Jews want, let's keep them happy. But I, I don't really want to kill an innocent man. I know what. There is a loophole in their law that says at Passover time, as an act of mercy, they allow one prisoner to go free. And we only have one other man arrested sitting back there right now, a notorious murderer by the name of Barabbas. Surely they wouldn't want Barabbas walking their streets, a murderer over this man who's really done nothing. So I'll give them the offer and they'll take Jesus and everything will be settled. So he mentioned this to the crowd, and the crowd had been getting gather now as close to, 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 to sunrise. The crowd had begun to gather, and, and Annas is against him, and Caiaphas is against him, and the religious leaders are all against him. So it must be the right thing to do, and the crowd gets into it. And, and, and he says, who do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? And they said, give us Barabbas. Then, then what do I do with Jesus? You crucify him. And Pilate didn't want to do that but he didn't want Rome to think he was inadequate. He didn't want a rebellion on his hands, so okay, okay. We'll crucify him. But I want you to know something. I wasn't for this. And he got a basin of water where everyone could see and washed his hands in front of the water. Everybody in the water, everybody could see this man's blood is off of my hands. He's on yours. Even his wife had had a dream that says, don't have anything to do with that man. He's innocent. He's yours. And so the crowd grabbed Jesus. And that's where our text stops. And there he stood. Bloodied. A victim of the most heinous injustice the world has ever known. The Jews broke their own laws to kill Jesus. Let me, let me show you quickly 12 ways they broke their own laws just to kill him. Look here on the screen. Number one, no formal charge was brought. They accused him of blasphemy. It's not, it wasn't a formal charge. And so they needed a formal charge for the death penalty. They didn't bring it. 
Any one of these would have got any other case kicked out of court. Number two, trials were held at night, illegal. The Jews said no trials can take place at night. Must be in the daytime where everybody can see and everybody has clear heads. They did all of them in the wee hour morning hours. Number three, judges brought charges without witnesses. They originally got some false witnesses. Caiaphas did. The others didn't. The rest of his trial, no witnesses. Just the judge's words. Number four. Charge was changed by the Jews when he was sent to the Romans. That was illegal. Told you why they did it. Number five. No witnesses were called on Jesus' behalf. According to Jewish law, if a man is up for his life, there must be witnesses called on his behalf. They called nobody for Christ. Number six. There were to be no trials held on a Jewish feast day. It's Passover. It's the beginning of unleavened bread. There should not have even been a trial. They had six of them. Number seven. His trials were concluded in one day. There was a law that if a death penalty was in play, then it had to be done over the course of more than one day. Because in one day, your head can get clouded and you can get emotional, give you time to sleep on it over several days to make sure your decision's right before you execute a man. They concluded... In one night. Number eight. He was condemned on a separate charge. So they declared him guilty for one reason and they executed him for another. Number nine. The merits of Jesus were not considered. Deuteronomy 31 says if a man is called into question and, and his life is on the line, you must consider the good things he's done as well as the bad things he's done. That never happened with Christ. Ten. Not all of the members of the Sanhedrin were present. If a death penalty or a recommended death penalty were passed along to the Jews, every one of the 71 of the Sanhedrin had to agree, but there were two missing that night. Two of the ones most likely would vote to exonerate Jesus. Number 11. His sentence was pronounced at a location forbidden by Jewish law. You cannot bring a pronouncement in the house of anybody, high priest or anybody. It had to be in their legal system. And number 12, hostile judges were to recuse themselves. It was obvious the ones, Caiaphas and others, hated Christ by Jewish law. If you have this hatred, if you're emotionally involved in a case, you recuse yourself and let others try it. They didn't do that. Any one of those 12 would have got a case kicked out of court. But they wanted Jesus dead so badly, they broke their own laws to do it. And there he stood, the greatest victim of injustice. Folks, we live in a culture that talks a lot about injustice. You hear the phrase a lot. Clearly, Jesus called out injustice, as did the Old Testament prophets. Jesus says that injustice, racial injustice, is wrong. Social injustice is wrong. Economic injustice is wrong. Emotional injustice is wrong. Every human should be treated according to what it means to be human. And all forms of injustice are wrong. And there's a man standing there, the epitome of injustice. But won't you notice something? Notice how he responded to injustice. He didn't get angry. He didn't riot. He didn't pick it in March he trusted the sovereignty of God no anger in fact before Herod never said a word trusting the will of the Father the plan of God to ultimately prevail not retaliating leaving ultimate justice to the hands of God. 
Folks, there he stood. The victim of injustice. So you could be reconciled to God. Father, thank you today for Jesus. Had I been in his place, I I probably would have cried out about the injustice happening to me. But Jesus, I'm thankful that you took my place. You went before different characters, some who hated you. And you spoke words that showed you were in control. You were right. And Lord, you willingly allowed the wheels of injustice to play out because you looked down the centuries and you saw me and you decided I was worth it. And Father, you looked down and saw everyone here. You decided they were worth it. So Father, thank you for taking our place. Now, may we give our lives back to you in submission, in love, in discipleship, to be bought by you and you alone. So, Lord, those decisions that need to be made today, give us the courage to make them. In Jesus' name.